First and foremost, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. My name is Joe Corey. I'm a professional business coach, and it's my honor to be the team leader for the Spaceport team here in Volusia County. And I thank each and every one of you for being here, and I thank our Daytona Regional Chamber for hosting the meeting and having this team. I think this is a very important day. We've come up to a point right now where we need to get the next level of information out to the supporters of this project in our community so we can help us in a wonderful, robust economic environment in the near future. And we believe this is one of the avenues to do this with. You have three items in front of you on your table. The first one is a very simple agenda and Mr. Jim Ball, who will be coming out in a moment, is gonna do our presentation today. Jim is, boy, to say he's extremely knowledgeable would be just an understatement. He is going to provide an insight to you today that will be very beneficial and bring a lot of clarity on the project and how the site was, was chosen. So we're very happy to have him here. Jim will stay after the meeting to answer questions if you'd like. He was willing to do that. We build the meeting from 11.30 to 1 o'clock, and we will be bringing the meeting and presentation to a close at 1 o'clock. So if you would like to stay after that, you are more than welcome to do so. There's two other items. There's a two-sided, one, uh, two one-page item that is the four topics that our team has worked on. We have looked at the four areas that seem to provoke the most questions and curiosity about bringing a launch site to Volusia County. And what we've done is we've identified those, and along with identifying, we are gonna show the benefit of those. Now the team members that are here today have been asked to identify which four areas they would like to support when it comes to us going to the podium at the next meetings that's coming up in uh, January, the open forums, to speak in favor of the spaceport. So I will be looking to try to get those names today to see the area that you're most interested under speaking at at the podium. Without any further ado, I think we want to get right to the reason why we're here, and that's Mr. Jim Ball. Jim? All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'll start with the opening caveats. Um, I don't know if Joe, well, maybe by way of introduction, I, missed, I might have missed a little bit of that. But <clears throat> I'm retired from NASA most of my career at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the last five to six years, I, uh, before I retired in February 2012, I was in spaceport planning and development, uh, engaged in uh, really looking at the future architecture of the center in terms of, of trying to reach out to facilitate um, expanded opportunities for other users, especially commercial users. Uh, have uh, quite a bit of experience working in both government and commercial space. I've been on both sides, been in the private sector in, in a commercial space company. And uh, so I've, I've, I've sort of, um, covered the landscape in terms of, of what it takes to identify, develop, facilitate, uh, and market a, a site or sites for commercial use in the space transportation industry. So working as a consultant, I am supporting and assisting Space Florida in all their efforts. Uh, they're not my only client, they're probably my favorite client. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Space Florida on these topics of, of a commercial spaceport initiative, both in a horizontal, uh, that's uh, for space systems that take off and land like an aircraft, sometimes they are partially aircraft, or vertical launch complexes like what we're talking about at, at Shiloh. Um, this is not a Space Florida presentation. This is my presentation. Um, it's, it's very informal, as you'll see as I go through, most of the charts are just visual charts to help keep me straight on what I'm talking about. And um, I will not be talking about, uh, in, in any detail, about the environmental impact statement. Space Florida made a, um, a judgment based on input from the FAA and others that um, they should not be conducting any public forum uh, discussions regarding 
uh, the details of the project site evaluation and that sort of thing uh, <clears throat> until we got into the EIS public scoping meetings. And those are going to be coming up very soon. Space Florida is a third party contract sort of arrangement. That contractor does work for the FAA uh, so that it's an independent and, uh, and transparent review of all the environmental issues. And as I said, that'll be beginning in January. So that's really the place for, for folks to be expressing their, their concerns and interest and for a very thorough description of the project. Um, having, having said that as a caveat, um, what I wanted to do and was asked to do today is to give you some business perspective um, on this project, give you a little bit of a summary of things we've already discussed that are publicly available and, and, uh, and try to answer some of your questions. I want to give you some history uh, of the Shiloh site as well that is publicly available, but it's not very publicly well known. I mean, it's just not history that is most people are familiar with, although some in the South Volusia County are certainly much more familiar with it than, than many of the rest of us. Um, I'm a sixth generation Floridian. I grew up in Miami, but don't hold that against me. Uh, my mom was born and raised in Titusville. My grandmother was born and raised in Titusville. Uh, she and her family had citrus groves, including citrus groves in the Shiloh area. Uh, I am very familiar with the territory, as well as being very familiar with the space industry and particularly the commercial space industry. I'll be happy to answer questions. I'm going to try to leave plenty of time for that. Um, and hopefully this is somewhat organized. I, I put, had to put it together fairly quickly, but you'll see some things perhaps you haven't seen before. Can everybody see or am I standing right in the, in the way? All right, Jim, next slide, please. I want to start by providing you a context and, and a little bit of a summary. I'm sure you've heard it before on why, why is this even happening? Why, why is this discussion going on? Why, why is anybody looking at putting a launch complex in the Shiloh area? What's wrong with the rest of the property at Kennedy Space Center? Well, uh, those are all good questions, and, and, and the easy, probably the easiest way to put this into context is to look at the map behind me. Um, if I'm blocking your view, I'll move, because you need to see, if you don't take anything else away than what you, what you, from today, what you should take away is there are many, many states and many countries that are in this business of facilitating space transportation. Nobody gets into space without a spaceport. You don't leave Earth without one. So in the old days, there were only a few. And of course, there was a time when only the Russia and the United States were, were vying for um, dominance in, in the space industry. Uh, those were before the days that anybody thought about how would you use space commercially. But those days were over a long time ago. And so when you think about Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Spaceport, uh, or Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, I should say, in a, in a legacy sense, yeah, that's true. That's where, that's where the nation's um, uh, launch systems were developed. That's where we sent uh, astronauts to the moon, the ISS, the space shuttle program. Uh, I personally had my NASA career span the entire range of the, of the space shuttle program. But since the, say, the um, 1980s, the world has become a very different place, a lot more competitive in this industry. Back, say, in the early 1980s, the United States had a, probably a full 100% of the commercial launch market. That is, those non-federal government payloads such as communication satellites uh, and satellites being launched for other countries that don't have launch systems that required purchasing a launch from somebody. We had 100% of that business, but beginning in the, uh, in the early 1980s and increasing since that time, the United States has lost market share. And the point is that now virtually uh, the United States is virtually at zero percentage. Now you're going to see a few um, 
a, f a few commercial payloads starting to come back in. SpaceX has been successful in capturing a few. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the SpaceX model here. But for all intents and purposes, the United States has been sort of iced out uh, of, of that marketplace. And that's really because other locations became more commercial friendly in meeting the needs of that non-federal market in that they were launch sites and launch, launch providers that could guarantee launch dates, um, could provide the access necessary to uh, international visitors and, and companies, and really focus and tailor their launch models and, and launch site operations to support a commercial marketplace. You look at Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, you have one as a DOD facility, the other is NASA. Um, their missions have been government missions. The NASA only launched NASA rockets. Um, to date, they have only launched NASA rockets from the Kennedy Space Center. Yes, there is some interest in being able to accommodate commercial systems that may be meeting NASA requirements like commercial crew or International Space Station. Um, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station is the same story. Um, they're there for national security, national defense. So why are we talking about Shiloh? Why, why aren't those other facilities um, amenable to commercial operations? Well, I, in some ways it's like if you operate a, a retail business or a, any, any kind of business that, that requires you to service a commercial marketplace, you're unlikely to conduct that business within the confines of a, of a government installation, that you have to cross through a security perimeter and a fence and a guard and all to get to that business. Because your customers are not those folks. Your customers are people that live outside that fence. And so once you try to accommodate that inside a federal environment, you find out all the nuts and bolts about why business and government practice have such a hard time coexisting. And it's not because of the ill will of any, anybody. It, it's because of the nature of the federal installations and what their mission is and what their rules are that they operate. This isn't a safety question. This is about culture and about prioritization of mission and, and the idea that if you're a commercial business serving a commercial marketplace, your ideal solution is to have a commercial site. So that's what is evidenced across this map of the United States where you see additional launch facilities that are being developed and even the idea that, um, well, I'll just give a few examples. New Mexico, a purpose-built spaceport for Virgin Galactic to conduct suborbital space flight. There's no reason that system can't operate off the shuttle landing facility, an existing facility. But why did they choose New Mexico? Because they wanted a commercial environment, operating environment for their system. And they could have that in a purpose-built spaceport in New Mexico that has none of the infrastructure to support space tourism that we have, but it was desirable because of, of for that purpose. They could build it and operate it the way they wanted to and be, and be masters of their own fate. Um, even, in, even with the Wallops Flight Facility and the commercial spaceport operated by Virginia, Virginia is largely independent. They use the, the NASA range, but they, they operate launch facilities largely on an independent basis um, at, at Wallops Island. Um, and now let's talk we, about um, other countries we already mentioned. Uh, the, map, the map down here is showing the launch complex uh, that the Europeans operate at French Guiana in Kourou. Um, this looks like Florida, but it's not. That's an Ariane a French rocket launching probably a couple of commercial uh, satellites into orbit. Uh, Russian Soyuz, that's not in Russia, that's actually at a launch pad in French Guiana. They have partnered with the Europeans to be able to launch their uh, Russian rockets from the European spaceport in, in, in Kourou. Um, but with that coupled with their facilities in Russia, uh, those two countries have come to dominate the commercial 
spacecraft business, satellite business. Not the manufacture of the satellites, but the launch of the satellites. Others are rapidly coming along. China, Japan, India. That's sort of the international. But let's just say, okay, well, so we've got to fight internationally to recapture market share that we've virtually lost almost all of. And, and hold the market share of new emerging markets like human spaceflight. Well, it'd be, it'd be tough enough just to challenge all those international sites, but there are many other locations in the United States, Texas, Georgia, Virginia, New Mexico, uh, Hawaii's coming on, that say, we, we think we can offer the commercial market and space transportation. We can be the spaceports of the 21st century and beyond. Not, the, not what was legacy, Kennedy Space Center and NASA, because those guys aren't changing. They're, they're not facilitating this business. They can't move fast enough. That's government. We can be the new commercial sites. Next slide, please. So Shiloh, given its separation, that area, given its separation from the rest of Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, is a location that can be on a, on a level playing field with sites that are being considered elsewhere. Um, we will get into a considerable amount of detail, which again, I'm not gonna do today, uh, in the EIS, in the presentation of the project, its purpose and need, as to what other alternatives were evaluated in Florida, what other alternatives were evaluated on the coast and at Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station that led to the identification of a general area that, that we have all come to know as Shiloh uh, as, as the candidate that the state of Florida, Space Florida, would put forward to industry to be the competitor to alternatives such as Georgia, Puerto Rico, and, and Texas. So what's What's the Shiloh competition site-wise? Everybody in this room probably has heard about Texas, uh, the Brownsville site. Texas may very well soon have more spaceports licensed than any other state in the, in the nation. You've got um, already licensed sites at McGregor. It's also a SpaceX site that you will see some, some images from. You got the Blue Origin site in West Texas. I met in mid-October out in New Mexico with the people at Midland from the, your counterparts, the economic development folks from Midland, Texas, are in the final stages of uh, licensing for, an, for a spaceport, a horizontal spaceport. x is moving their R&D facilities from Mojave to uh, Midland, Texas. That'll be three. And they're well along in the, in the area to the, to the east of Brownsville in, in a licensing of a, of a spaceport, SpaceX is, uh, that they would build as a commercial spaceport facility there. Um, that decision hasn't been finalized yet, either by the FAA or by, by SpaceX. They, they are publicly say frequently that Texas is leading but they haven't stopped talking to Georgia, they haven't stopped talking to us. And as recently as mid-October, Gwen Shotwell said Puerto Rico is a beautiful site. It's close to the equator, it's got its logistics challenges, but it's a wonderful site. The people in Puerto Rico are putting something together pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so that's the Brownsville site. Um, that's Jacksonville, right at the very top of Florida and right across the state line in Camden County is a site that NASA considered very strongly back in the Apollo-Saturn period. In fact, it became the runner-up, if you will, to the selection of Cape Canaveral. It is a good site. It is a site that could have supported the Saturn V rocket being launched. Um, it has gone dormant, and in fact, the actual site that NASA looked at was Cumberland Island. That's now a national wildlife or, or a national seashore and a wildlife refuge, the entire island is. But uh, at the point you see there, the site of the potential spaceport, there was an industrial area that was developed by uh, some chemical companies and there was a chemical plant there, a pretty well developed piece of infrastructure 
that uh, is no is dormant. It went 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 dormant as an industrial site, but has been now identified as a potential spaceport site in Georgia. Your counterparts in Camden are working that very hard, very hard. Um, so next chart. So what, what, what is this site going to look like? How big is this thing? So uh, Joe and others have mentioned, you know, folks don't quite grasp the scale uh, of what we're talking about here. So this is the proposed site layout for the Texas uh, location. It was in the EIS. Um, the property line, this is right at the end of Texas 4. It's about three miles north of the Mexican border. The green line marks the private property outline of, of, of a parcel that would be leased by SpaceX. It's about 56 acres total inside the green. Most of it, or much of it, is wetlands. In fact, something like six to eight acres of wetlands will be destroyed if this site is built. The area inside the yellow is basically, we'll call it the fence line, the operational area is about 25, 26 acres. This is what we're talking about. Um, that, part, that site, the, the, the built site's no more than 500 feet in width, and it's about 2,000 feet in length. So what we have been talking about, and we'll go into more detail, this is in the, um, was in the RFQ for the environmental contractor, is somewhere on the order of about 30 acres for each operator. Well, this is one of the templates, and I'm going to show you some other locations. On, on how that site could be laid out pretty, pretty much in a, in a linear fashion. Um, and you see State Road 4 there, Texas State Road 4, think about Florida State Road 3. And, and the idea of, of a couple of launch operators uh, having facilities similar in, in configuration to that. And you begin to get at least a sense of the kind of thing we're talking about. This site, as well as Shiloh, is surrounded by National Wildlife Refuge, historic sites, national monuments, public access beachfront, and indeed, so is, so is Georgia. I mean, the, the fact is that you know, suitable coastal launch sites almost invariably, well, in, invariably do exist with areas that, that have not become urbanized, and are te tend to be um, either recreationally oriented or have, have a number of, of preservation areas associated with them. That's, that's what makes them even viable as launch sites. Uh, so there's a great need for space transportation, tr space launch sites to peacefully coexist with the environment in which they are located, which almost invariably is gonna be sensitive coastal environment if not here, somewhere else. Next chart. But it will happen. This is the kind of vehicle that we're, um, one of a number of vehicles that we're looking at as candidate vehicles. This is the new um, Falcon, uh, Falcon 9.1. It's the new version. This is the liftoff out at Vandenberg Air Force Base in, uh, at the end of September. And during this flight, uh, SpaceX company began to demonstrate powered flyback. They successfully were able to fire um, three of the engines to do a retro uh, fire to begin bringing that booster back towards the coast and, and begin, they're, they're in their learning curve of how do you get a fully reusable booster system. Um, next slide. This is what SpaceX calls the grasshopper. Uh, it, they have now retired this. This was a, um, a, a basically the same size as the SpaceX first stage core, core booster uh, with a single engine on it, single Falcon 1 engine. This at the McGregor site was being used to demonstrate vertical takeoff and vertical landing. They have, they have pushed that as far as they can at the, at the McGregor site in terms of altitude. Um, but they've done it very successfully. And if you can, 
get on and search the video to look at the last grasshopper flight, you'll, you'll swear it was animation, that somebody, you know, did this in a, in a you know, uh, Pixar studio or something. But, in fact, it is, it is a real test flight, and uh, they, they went to uh, a considerable altitude with it and successfully landed it on that small concrete pad. Next chart. SpaceX is going to New Mexico for the next round of reusable booster development. And in the words of Gwen Shotwell, president of SpaceX, New Mexico gave us the operating environment that we needed in order to take this to the next level. And, and, and they're going to go much higher, they're going to get to the edge of space, and they're going to demonstrate that they can bring that booster back and land it on a concrete pad at the New Mexico spaceport. We still can take some comfort for a period of time and that it is unlikely that orbital launches would prove practical from New Mexico at this time. But if you begin to connect the dots here, you see that nobody's waiting for it all to happen here. Everybody is trying to figure out how do we get in this game and become the spaceport of the future, assuming Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center become the spaceports of the past? That those are museums, that's the way you used to do it. We want to be at the forefront of what, what is going to be the next century of space transportation. Volusia County can be there, but we're not going to be able to pull this off in doing business as usual down in the existing installations the way that the, the world exists today. Or, or we can envision it existing any time in the near future. Georgia, Texas, New Mexico, Puerto Rico, Virginia, Hawaii, they're all going to move out because the alternative is for this industry to go overseas 100%. Next. Next chart, please. Um, lots of discussion surrounding this project has focused on SpaceX, but that is a mistake. Um, Shiloh is not about a single company. It, it, the, the, the state's requirement for um, a space launch, commercial space launch facility complex is baselined on, on uh, accommodating two operators. And that's not to say that one of those operators with a dedicated pad might not even accommodate more than one system, type of system on their pad. Uh, but uh, Blue Origin, this is a page out of a out of a commercial crew presentation that I just happened to be able to Google and pull off of there. So it's, this is publicly available information that just shows you Blue Origin is, is, is also a rapidly developing capability. They're not PowerPoint, they, they're flying stuff. Uh, this is one of their vehicles that's showing suborbitally, showing their capability to launch and land vertically with the vehicle staying intact. They're planning on flying people, humans, on this. Both of these companies, SpaceX and Blue Origin, by the way, ultimately have their sights set on flying humans. So it's not just about flying experiments or commercial spacecraft, like satellites. Um, Blue Origin perhaps uh, uh, has been um, more secretive, uh, not perhaps, they have been more secretive, but they have been more consistently focused themselves on the, on the uh, human spaceflight development. Uh, SpaceX, though, as well, has said from the start, we're building this rocket to fly humans, we're just in the meantime going to fly NASA's cargo missions because that helps us develop. They, they, are, they are a front-running candidate to fly NASA astronauts to the International Space Station. Um, the, actually, the, the, the rocket, the orbital rocket that Blue Origin is developing is very similar in size, capability, and the propellants it would use and such, so the, as, as a SpaceX Falcon 9. So Space Florida, and what I've been advising and working with them on, is developing what we call a composite set of requirements, and composite being there's an envelope set of requirements for the Shiloh Launch Complex that would say each of those two launch pads will have 
equal capability in terms of supporting the size of rockets, the type of propellants, et cetera, such that we can accommodate uh, a family of, of, of rockets that are now in development or have been developed and are, fly, are being flown by industry. So, you know, SpaceX, Falcon 9, Blue Origins booster, uh, you're going to see the Antares that's flown by Orbital Sciences, um, United Launch Alliance's Atlas V, the Delta IV. So when we come to describe this project and we define both the on-site and the off-site capabilities that are required, this is not for one company. This is not for SpaceX. Would we like to be competitive to capture the SpaceX uh, facility? Yes, and we think we will be. Is it just about them? No. So, and are they the only ones that will do this? No. Next. Sure. Um, again, trying to give you just a sense of, of scale and size so that this doesn't, you know, so you don't have in your image this gigantic launch complex like NASA built for the Saturn V and the Space Shuttle. This is the existing uh, Falcon 9 complex at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station that launches um, the, the government missions to the ISS, um, International Space Station. This is their processing hangar. This is probably on the order of about 60 feet tall. It's not very far from the launch stand. Goes up, a, 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 comes out on a, on a rail, and then is erected out here at the launch stand. I don't know what the exact acreage of that site is. It might be, it's, it's larger than what SpaceX would have to have starting with a fresh site, because it was originally a site that was used for the Titan rocket, a much larger rocket, actually. Next, please. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of images of the Virginia uh, spaceport, uh, commercial spaceport, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport that's located, um, co-located with NASA at Wallops. Um, this is their rocket, the Antares, and again, you can kind of, here's a vehicle, here's a truck and a, and a little trailer there. Um, this is the horizontal integration facility they use. It looks very similar. Um, and that's the kind of the end product. That, that's what flies on top to go to the International Space Station. They've launched successfully from Virginia, so now NASA has two launch providers that can meet the need of delivering cargo to the space station. One is based in Florida, one is based in Virginia. There was a time when they both would have been based in Florida but our ability to, be, to offer a compelling operating environment has not kept up with industry's need for, for the type of, of launch facility that they, they want to meet their, their customers' requirements. Next, please. That's what, a, that's what a horizontal integration facility looks like inside. It's really not a very fancy building. It looks like a great big hangar. And, and the, the, the rocket gets integrated inside of that. They have hoist and uh, put it on a transporter to go out to the launch pad. This facility is sized so you can have probably two, uh, two launch vehicles in there. We may well use this as sort of a template for, for both on-site and off-site type of capabilities that would be required. You're looking at a facility that's probably on the order of of 37,000 square feet, something like that. Next. And this gives you an aerial view of the Wallops Island facility. Um, it's tight. There's not a lot of acreage there, and it's very linear. This is the, the pad uh, without the rocket on it, and it comes up down this road from the horizontal integration facility down there. Wallops has a second launch pad right here that's used for solid-fueled vehicles. They just launched a Minotaur V uh, with, a, with a planetary payload, the first planetary payload to be launched from Wallops. It went to the moon, um, our nearest planetary body. 
and uh, they have high hopes for doing other stuff there. They're also talking about building another pad that's a liquid fueled pad to support a growing commercial business they expect to capture. That pad may well not even be on Wallops, NASA Wallops property. Next. So, Shiloh. Um, I found, uh, looking around a little bit, and I thought it was kind of fun to throw it on this chart, the, the Shiloh uh, brand of Indian River Citrus. This was a label that belonged to Shiloh. Uh, it was used at the packing house, I guess, and was exclusively used for all the citrus growers in the Shiloh area that marketed their Indian River fruit through this and, and other labels. Um, Shiloh, you'll hear a lot about Elliot's plantation, and um, to be sure, um, that plantation complex, which is pretty much to the, to the north end, uh, we can't say specifically where any of the remaining uh, portions are located, but <clears throat> that was, uh, represents the British colonial period, and uh, hey, it's a marvelous part of our history. The history that you may not hear as much about is the fact that Shiloh became a community somewhere in the late 1880s uh, from uh, folks that moved to this area uh, after the Civil War. It was, the first buildings were constructed by salvaged shipwrecked lumber and um, because of its high elevation, relatively well, the, high, the well drained soil, um, it was ideal for citrus and so by the time that um, Kennedy Space Center, by the, the property was being acquired for the NASA project. Uh, there were about 3,000 acres of citrus all over Kennedy Space Center and several hundreds, probably up around five or six hundred acres in the, in the general vicinity of Shiloh. The, the, the man and woman you see there, Mr. and Mrs. David Taylor at their Shiloh home in, in 1963, it might have actually been January of 1964, I don't recall, on their, basically their last day. They, they were evicted from their home and their groves, as was uh, every other resident of Shiloh at the time, because the government condemned the property or purchased it outright for the space program, period. That's why the property was acquired. Um, this, by the way, is an artist's rendering of what, we've, what we have used in the past to show what one possible layout might look like of, of, a, of a, one of the facilities at Shiloh. And that would be a, a, a representative of the heavy version of any of those rockets we just were looking at. Next chart. So I said that it was acquired for the space program. What happened? You know, why, why wasn't there enough property? already. No, why did they have to acquire property north of Hallover Canal? Um, well, all of those residents surely asked that question. Many of them are still asking that question today. Why, why did you need it? Well, this is an illustration of what was in mind at the time. And the fact of the matter is it shouldn't be a surprise that NASA and the Air Force were already in a land use conflict over in 1962 over who would get what land for what launch pads and what programs. And so uh, getting into the Titan program, uh, the Air Force said to NASA, move your launch pads north. We think you ought to go, go up on Canaveral, wasn't Canaveral Seashore at the time. Uh, and we'll use some of this new land down here that Congress said you could buy for the, for the moon program. NASA said to the Air Force, no, you take your program and you go north. And they both finally agreed, well, there really isn't, isn't um, all that much land already acquired to take care of our respective needs, so we're going to go ahead and take the rest of this. Volusia County at the time was talking about extending A1A down, paved. There was a referendum on it. I don't know how the referendum turned out. I haven't researched that. But they were, the government was clearly scared of it, that it was going to increase property price because the pavement and people were going to have beach homes and all of that and nobody thought too much about the, the Shiloh area uh, or, or the people that lived in that area there wasn't a lot of urbanization going on so the government's opinion was 
it ain't going to get any cheaper. It's pretty, probably pretty cheap now. We can get this for a low amount of money. Let's acquire it, and then it'll be available when we develop the Nova rocket. We'll need that land, or the Air Force might use it. They weren't sure. Next chart. So, as you know, um, that Nova program never happened. The Air Force never decided to build anything up there. I was personally involved in NASA over the years at one or two other projects that, that strongly considered those areas for different either launch operations or re recovery, re-entry operations. And for a variety of reasons, um, it, it, w it had not been employed for space program purposes except on a very minor basis like the Shiloh radar station, mid-course mid radar station. So, um, in fact, a, as part of the wildlife refuge, and then Congress made the National uh, Seashore Area, uh, it has been uh, largely undisturbed, uh, most of it since the end of the citrus agriculture period. Uh, let, let me just explain on this area. The, this is in something we call the preliminary environmental site review because we wanted to sort of identify for that whole land area to the north of Hallover Canal that would, that would be reasonable alternatives for this new complex. What would be sort of environmentally the, the best areas to look at? And you'll, you'll see from this that excluded was the Canaveral Seashore for reasons of its sensitivity. It's so narrow, it's going to require a lot of infrastructure, dredging, that sort of thing. Um, and, but you know, there's a lot of land over here. That's part of Canaveral National Seashore. And what I've said to the folks I've taken on, on, on a dry, kind of a quick drive around down there, is you'll see as you look to that more easterly property that that has been very heavily managed for um, environmental species like scrub jays, in particular for the scrub jay habitat. This western area to the west has not, because it's not really suitable habitat for, for scrub jays. So um, because of the boundary of Canaveral Seashore, because of the environmental sensitivity, for, for, for a variety of reasons like that, we, we focus the search for what we thought would be reasonable alternatives into this area here. We did learn working with the National Park Service early on that there was a fair uh, portion of, of, the, of that northern section that um, should probably be encumbered and not, not developed or not considered for um, a complex site because of Elliott Plantation because of Elliott Plantation interest. We don't know specifically um, where the, the, the um, you know, if there's any remnant um, uh, sugar mill ruins or that sort of thing, plantation quarters, slave quarters, canals, what have you. Uh, those tend to be, and they're not all located in here. A lot of that is up further. Um, those all need to be documented, and, and we said from the get-go we would stay out of there. We, we would stay away from that. So, but this was the area that we had our environmental uh, site review contractor look at, and it ultimately became about 1,200 acres, maybe a little bit shy of 1,200 acres. Of that, we were looking for what's, what's a suitable 200 acres that could come under state control and recognizing that of that 200 acres that would be mostly buffer for two operators, you'd be talking about a, a, a built environment inside their fence lines, respectively, of about 26 to 30 acres, okay? We also had a, a criteria that it has gr emerged over, over time that we, we needed to look at separation of those two operators so they're not shoulder to shoulder so that they can operate safely and conduct flyback tor sor sort of operations. So that, that was another criteria we were going to look at. Next chart. So in looking at that ground, and, and it's now going to orient you um, 
on this. This is a 1969 image. Uh, this was taken um, an aerial view that shows the, all these citrus groves in here. Uh, this was a Taylor property right here where you saw Mr. and Mrs. Taylor. Their house, the grocery store was still standing. They had the post office in Shiloh. If you drive down State Road 3, unless I point it out to you where it is, you won't know it's there. National Park Service didn't mark it. This was the Taylor residence. The Taylor Road would have told you, but they changed the name of Taylor Road. It's now something else. It's WPS something. I don't know. They're, they're some, they, they give this road a different name. But this indeed is where the, the center of, of the, the Shiloh uh, community, the Taylors, uh, there were a number of other residences that were in, in and near this area um, back at the, in the period of, of, the, of the government's taking over the land. Those groves and, and many of the structures continued to stay intact until um, the late 19, oh, probably the early 1980s, early to mid 1980s. And around the late 70s, early 80s, you had a series of very devastating freezes in the area that killed, uh, killed off many of the, of the groves, especially on the northern part of the, of the center. The Park Service and the Wildlife Refuge said, well, we really didn't want groves there anyway, so we're, gonna, we're not going to lease them back out. We're not going to try to keep them in active production, whereas some of the other groves further south continued to stay under under active cultivation until just a few years ago. But they didn't do anything else with them either. So even today you will see remnants of the citrus groves in aerials of the property and, and on ground surveys. Next, please. Next turn. In the yellow area there, which you can see superimposed the, the search um, area, that was all citrus agriculture, every acre. And if you look at the areas that's not, if you want to avoid wetlands, if you want to avoid um, habitat that is scrub jay habitat, um, if you want to go into fallow areas that were on orange groves or fallow orange groves now, uh, those, are the, those are the ground sites you would look at. So we've, we began to get fairly comfortable through the environmental site review that we had indeed done a, a, a pretty good job of trying to find um, at least, you know, decent candidate ground to consider for, for these sites. Next chart, please. Is that it? Okay, go back then. Go back one. Uh, one more? Yeah, go up one. Yeah, I mean, go, go back one. All right, what, what, you're, what you see here in these notional launch facilities, um, this is in a public document, and I, I'm going to just explain. Don't, we have not selected those as launch sites. Um, what they represent are sites that for a variety of, of analysis that was done in the, in the, in the preliminary ESR, uh, they were looked at. What they do show is you've got about a two miles, about two miles, from, from this one to, th to this one down there. And so as we get into uh, further refinement and definition of the alternatives for the environmental impact statement, we will narrow down to where um, there will be a proposed, uh, maybe a couple of proposed configuration alternatives for where these launch sites could be. I will say that without um, much question, you cannot put both pads in either Volusia County or Brevard County. They don't fit within this site area. So we anticipate that the, all, of the, all of the alternatives are going to look at, at uh, it, you know, what I, I'm pretty convinced is going to be one site in Volusia County, one launch pad in Volusia County complex, and, and the other one likely in Brevard County. Just because where the county road, uh, the county line is, you know, we didn't put it there. <laughs> it's, it's where it is. At one time, it would have all been in Volusia County. I know that because it didn't change until Henry Titus um, sold a bunch of property in Titusville. 
to uh, have a new, they, they decided to come up with a new line for where Volusia and Brevard would be separated. North Brevard at that time, at one time was part of, part of, uh, of Volusia County. So I don't know if it was Titus that, that caused that change or not. I know he got the county seat in Titusville. So that is, um, I'm gonna leave that one up for, the, for, for taking questions. I'll make to that is at this point because we are dealing with a composite set of requirements it's not like in Texas you know uh, SpaceX designed their 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 site exactly the way they wanted to that turned out where they were going to locate 26 acres we wanted to we want to provide a little bit of of margin if you will so at this point we probably would say you know th approximately 30 30 acres maybe less but we don't want to say 26 and have it be 28 and somebody's going to say, well, you promised it would only be. Uh, we're, we're, going to, we're going to get into all of that dialogue when we get into the EIS. Expect that it's going to talk in terms of, a, of approximately, um, you know, inside their, their immediate fence line of being about 30 acres. We will have to look at impacts outside of that in, in terms of, you know, exhaust and all of that, noise, what, what have you. So, uh, but... If, if you think this is going to look like Complex 39 at Kennedy Space Center with the VAB and the Launch Control Center and the long, you know, gravel three and a half miles out to the launch pad, it, it's not. Okay. Other questions? I, th th I think that is uh, got some, some merit to that argument. I think, I think there's also a sense amongst these competitive sites that... Um, the future is theirs to seize, and we've sort of given it up. Yep. You know that there's a if you and if you talk within our own community, um, given all the really legitimate environmental concerns and issues that there are, as there are in Texas, and there would be in Georgia, and there would be in Puerto Rico, and there were in New Mexico, um, in the area that out in the desert where that site was built. Those are always discussions you have to have. But if, if, if you, if you kind of get further, deeper in, into thinking about people's psychology, we're tied to the past. We're complacent. There's been an assumption that this is a birthright or something for the Space Coast, that, that we own it. We will always own it. This is great. This is NASA. This is the Air Force does their thing. And, and we've almost just not had our eyes open watching this industry go somewhere else. So if the state of Florida, this is why Space Florida is so committed to, to trying to articulate why this is necessary for the state to adopt a, and drive a new operating environment uh, for this commercial industry, lest we see it just migrate everywhere else. Yes, sir. There, there is some overlap in that um, the whole of, Ken this, this is part of Kennedy Space Center. So this kind of, of um, it's a fallacy to think that, that the government property got partitioned. That somewhere there's this line that's called Beach Road or something and that north of that it's the Wildlife Refuge and south of that it's Kennedy Space Center. That's, that's just not true. Kennedy Space Center is all of this 149 acres of property. The Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge is all of that 140 acres of property. Um, so environmentally, there's been a significant amount of NASA environmental work done. In, 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 um, there, as I said, a number of projects looked at, at going up there. So this study will, will leverage off of all of those previous studies that were done. So it's not 100% like starting from scratch. Having said that, there's been nothing on that property, um, uh, you know, in the, even in the disturbed areas uh, since, you know, the 19, late 1970s. Uh, certainly no residential. I mean, that all, that all ended. All the active, the, the active cultivation probably ended in, in the late 70s. The residential uh, occupancy ended in 1963, 1964. So since that time, um, those areas have been, it, 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 if I don't mow my yard every two weeks, you know, it begins, portions of it begin to look like a jungle. I mean, Florida takes over. You've got oak trees that have grown up. You have, 
you know, probably pretty good habitat for migratory songbirds, just like your yard is. If you got oak trees in your yard, they're not an endangered species, but they, they come in. And it's not that there's not biological um, activity that we're going to have to understand and assess. Um, gopher tortoises, it's, it's perfect. Uh, we'll probably find some gopher tortoise. So, um, but there, there, there's not, back in the 1960s when they were talking about the Nova launch pads and, the, and maybe the Air Force Titan, there was no requirement for doing environmental studies back then. And they dredged across Banana River and filled it in, Banana Creek, so, so they could build Complex 39. Does that answer your question? Well, let's talk about what it takes to get to the green light. We're about um, a year, approximately, and doing the details of an environmental impact statement to, a, to the point of a draft. And, and then you, you, that, that includes going through the public scoping, saying, hey, let's get all the concerns and issues on the table so that we analyze all the right things, that the FAA will do that, say that. Uh, getting to the point where the FAA will be comfortable in making a, a decision and a record of decision is about We'll add, add some more months onto a year. It probably not as long as 18 months, but certainly more than a year. Uh, at that point, we're, and what Space Florida will be doing in the interim is developing all the other aspects of a site application for this to become a licensed uh, launch site. And uh, there's about another six months on top of, of, of the environmental for that. So let's say it's about two years out, maybe. Maybe. And then, you know, the truth of the matter is the marketplace is going to decide the timing. You know, SpaceX is wanting a site now. They're, they're wanting to decide it very quickly and move into construction very quickly. So they're, they're pushing the, the, um, the permitting, if you will, um, timetable with the thought that as soon as they get the decisions, they're going to pull the trigger on the site and start building it. Um, Blue Origin is getting very aggressive about the time frame that they'd like to be operating. Some of the other operators are already flying out of other locations, but could well uh, be in a position to want to take advantage of a commercial operating environment if it was going to be made available to them. It's a really difficult question to answer. But you're, time, time wise, you're talking probably a, a period of, a, of, of about two years minimum before you would actually see, you know, action on construction of a site. The operating environment, the, the site that SpaceX will build will be in a greenfield site, it, it, whether it's Texas or Georgia or Puerto Rico or here. Um, Blue Origin has no launch site right now. Um, the idea that either of those companies or others might operate off of Kennedy Space Center is not out of the question. Um, that I think you'd have to um, postulate that uh, certainly what SpaceX has said is that they will launch from government facilities to support their government customers and missions. If they happen to be able to launch a commercial payload out of there, it fits, that they'll probably do it. But they have articulated, as have others, that in the, over the long run, they they need a site that's independent of federal installations. Did, I, did, did that answer your question? You look, look, you're reaching for what's going to motivate them, somebody to come use this site versus one of the others. It's who, who puts the best economic climate together. Jim is willing to stay and answer questions. So if you have the time to stay and chat with him, we want you to do that for clarity. We do want to make something very clear about this meeting today, is that we love Volusia County, we being the business people, the residents, the Chamber of Commerce. We respect our environment and we have been convinced that this can be done without harming the environment and helping our economic growth here. We need you, be very candid to you, we need the people in this room who support this when the time comes to go up and speak at the podium when the three minutes are given. And we want to be organized in a manner to present properly and factually 
what we know to be something that will be very helpful to us. We need you informed and we want the best for our county, our citizens, our children. And we see this as a grand opportunity to do that. With that said, we're going to adjourn the meeting and we're gonna thank Jim. Thank you very much. I Thanks. Thanks.